Yeah. It's nice how that you need to drop it around there. Okay. Okay. You're expecting that that He's really happy. The Madeline's the junior. He's the one up here. He's not a teacher. 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 He's not a Sorry, that's a little bit of a drug. That's okay. Yeah. No, no, no. Uh, you know, probably once a month we'll go to lunch with him or to take him out for dinner. Never? Yeah. Never? Not really. I mean, not yeah. really. In a sense, I mean, he's from his home for the summer. He's just there. He's definitely. He likes his life. And he starts, he starts late. Like he's out. So he, he lives on Sunday. He just can't wait. sign-in sheet. Everything will be done online. Um, it's fairly easy to do. It shouldn't be a major transition. It'll be much easier for people on the outside, people in the room. It may be a little tougher, but you can do it on your smartphone. So if you bring your smartphones, it's very easy to do, very quick. So in the email that we send out, I'll go over this, the first few journal clubs. Um, you go down to the bottom here and click on the Catalyst link. So that will bring up this screen. Again, it's fairly easy. So you just type in your name, get it spelled right. Um, go to the talk here, so Dr. Frank's talk is right there. Uh, and then put in the word of the day, and today it is compliment control. So I'd recommend writing that down or doing this right away. Control is you, you guys get the idea. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so just make sure if you uh, spell it wrong, you don't get credit. You don't get credit. Uh, that's a joke. It's, you can get credit. Just make it close. Um, go down here and continue with evaluation. Um, it's on the next screen. Again, very easy, and I did it on my smartphone today, so it shouldn't be a major transition. I'll go over this for the first few. It's much easier. It's much more green, so we don't have as much paper. So if there are any questions, email Kimberly or myself, and we can help you out with that process, but hopefully it won't be too hard of a transition for folks. And in the beginning, I'm always going to have the... Uh, the word, try and have it on a slide each time. So uh, today is it's compliment control. So write that down or put it in your smartphone now. And again, let me know if there are any questions. Hopefully it won't, won't be too big a transition for everyone. You probably have to do it at the end of the talk too. For a good way. <laughs> Only because some people are going to check in at 10 minutes. They were doing that anyway, I'm sure. Yeah, no, I, I agree. You can do it when, it has to be done, that's another good point. It has to be done within one week too. Um, so, without further ado, I'll give away here. Looks like our ABs have been ready today, so that's good. Thanks, Drew. Um, that'll save a, a lot of time at the end of the year, just uh, it used to take weeks to compile all the CME. The CME office here at the University of Oakland, not listening, are a complete pain in the ass to work with. <laughs> But in any event, <laughs> welcome back, everybody. I hope you had a good summer. I'm glad to see everybody. I think we have a great uh, series for this year. 
certainly starting with a great speaker, a good friend, and a, a world-class scientist. It's really an honor to have Mike here. He, you may wonder why he's actually not talking uh, straight up about HAE or some variant of that uh, for uh, two reasons. One, Bruce Zura, a good friend and colleague, is actually going to do a more didactic talk a little later in the year on that. But we're going to have a professor's rounds to follow and present a case which will let him talk about angioedema and all its variants. So those on the line and as many as possible in the room stay for the second hour because there should be a lot of insights from that as well. But this is another area of his lifelong interest, the complement system. And so he's going to talk about antibody and complement in controlling infectious agents. Mike, thanks very much for coming. Pleasure to have you. Good morning. Um, so when Len, as he said, invited me in the spring uh, to come here and give a talk, we talked about my talk, my, my speech would be about hereditary angioedema, something I talk about pretty regularly. Uh, but when it turned out that Bruce, uh, who was a good friend, uh, is coming in a couple of months, uh, it, it, uh, it became sort of untenable. Uh, and I decided to, to talk about something that you really don't know anything about. Uh, and so... Uh, but let me give you a little bit more background. First, let me say thank you. I want to say thank you to the University of Washington. I want to say thank you to Len Altman. Uh, I want to say thank you to, to Mita and Dyax, who are the sponsors. Uh, Dyax is the sponsor of, uh, of my visit. Uh, and Heidi Mamet uh, was very nice to pick me up at the airport and take me to the hotel, etc. cetera. Um, so, the th so the thank yous are important. Um, I probably ought to say given uh, uh, your problem with uh, continuing education, et cetera, uh, that, that uh, uh, I do have a little bit of, of money coming in from other places, and, and this is the list. Um, the, the, um, uh, that re relates to hereditary angioedema, at least. Uh, the reason for this talk is, is actually that one of the members of my department uh, at Duke uh, is um, uh, Rebecca Buckley. And Rebecca is the leading person in the world, really, uh, on immunodeficiency. And <clears throat> she gave her the talk she always gives to the new fellows uh, about two or three weeks ago, uh, and basically talked about all the B-cell defects and all the T-cell defects and all the various defects. And in the last 30 seconds of her talk, she said, and the complement defects, oh, all you have to do is an AH50 and a CH50, uh, and those will be normal, and the patient won't have a complement defect, and that's all you have to know. <laughs> Uh, but that isn't all you have to know at this point in time. When I started doing complement work, it really was a um, uh, chance. I did not decide to do complement work. Uh, I just wound up doing it. Um, and at the time that I started, I really thought that, that complement was going to turn out to be really very important, uh, that it was going to make a huge difference in disease and in our understanding of illness. Uh, and that did not take place. Uh, basically, uh, uh, many years later, uh, we find ourselves in pretty much the same position, except that the world is changing. And the advice that Dr. Buckley gave to the fellows in allergy immunology turns out to be incorrect. Uh, the whole field is undergoing a huge change. Um, and it's a change that no one is going to be capable of understanding, except maybe some people in the allergy immunology community, maybe some rheumatologists. Uh, it's something that's sort of become uh, difficult to understand in a field that was always considered difficult to understand. Uh, and because it is not in the main frame of, uh, of uh, T cell and, and B cell defects, uh, it is, uh, it, it, it's something that I think is worth knowing about. Now, the next thing that, that, uh, that made me think about what to talk about today was that a major drug company, well, major small drug company, um, that is in the business of making monoclonal antibodies um, and uh, invited me to talk for a very particular reason. They had developed a mouse, uh, and the mouse, uh, they very cleverly uh, took all the mouse's immunoglobulin genes and replaced them with human immunoglobulin genes. So when the mouse made antibody, it made human antibody. Terrific model. Uh, and they then went and spent millions and millions and billions of dollars 
making antibody to every infectious agent known to man. Uh, and they invited me down uh, basically because none of them were working. Uh, they didn't come up with a single monoclonal antibody that made a difference in an infectious disease. Uh, and they, they, they uh, uh, were sort of very upset by this uh, uh, thing, which they did not expect. Um, I got invited down, not because I work on it uh, now, but because the field is so barren. The field of compliment is so barren. There are so few grants, etc., that they really didn't have anybody else to invite. So they invited me. Uh, when you think about compliment, uh, and this is the way everybody thinks about compliment, you think about compliment being, being deposited in the glomerulus or in the skin or somewhere and causing disease. This is the picture of the typical glomerulus in a patient with glomerulonephritis uh, with compliment deposited in the glomeruli. How the compliment gets into the glomeruli has never absolutely been clear, but in fact we think that it's a problem of immune complexes or antibody to something in the kidney or something. Now, I work, uh, one of my grants is, is, is in uh, working with HIV, uh, and for a talk about HIV, I actually uh, spent five minutes online making a list of viruses that activate or inactivate complement, because in fact, HIV field has no interest in complement whatsoever, like most fields. Uh, and this is a list that I came up with in literally five minutes. And almost every bacterium activates complement. Um, and so, in fact, this system is sitting around. Part of the reason why nobody worries about it is it's always working. For complement defects, most of them I have never seen a single case in a very long career. So it's not like SCID. It's not like severe combined immunodeficiency where cases come in on a regular basis. Mostly you don't see them at all. This is an experiment that we did many, many years ago to make a point. And that is, this is guinea pigs. We gave the guinea pigs pneumococci. Guinea pigs are very resistant to pneumococci. They don't get very sick. Um, and what happens, and maybe we have a point here. Well, maybe we have a point. Yeah, here's a point. Um, if you give pneumococci to a guinea pig, normal guinea pig, you get the black line. So you get rapid clearance of pneumococci. This is colony counts. Um, and then you get a period of small numbers of bacteria in the circulation. Then you get a period in which the numbers of bacteria go up, and then you get something called definitive clearance. Now, we did this experiment, uh, but we weren't the first ones to do this experiment. Um, Headley Wright did it in rabbits in 1936, um, and every other animal has been studied this way. Uh, and they all, and every other organism has been studied this way. And this curve is generally found in almost every situation. Uh, for a while, maybe every decade, people try to figure out what the curve was about. And then finally, they gave up. So there is no feature of this curve that is understood. Well, we think that the rapid clearance has to do with the sugars on the bacterial membrane. We don't know that. We have no idea why small numbers of bacteria continue to come out into the circulation. <coughs> the number always goes up, and then there's definitive clearance. So that's interesting about this particular curve. Now, if you do this in an animal <clears throat> that has a debilitated complement system, you get the red curve. So the bacteria start to be clear, then the bacteria overgrow and kill the animal. And one of the interesting things about this curve is you can hyperimmunize the animal with the bacteria before you do the experiment, and you get exactly the same result. The bacteria kill in this case, the guinea pig. So we know, and as I said, this experiment is not my experiment. It's an experiment that's been done very many times. So when we think of complement, we think of effector functions, and we think of three major effector functions. Now, you've got to understand that complement, I'm used to saying, is 30 proteins. I recently was at a meeting with somebody who pointed out that there are an awful lot of proteins that turn out to affect whether these 30 proteins are working properly. But it's a lot of proteins. And not only that, but it's, these are ancient proteins, meaning that the complement system is, both, is really very much older than the antibody system. In evolution, the antibody system arises at the level of the fish. Uh, sea urchins have complement. Mosquitoes have complement. All of these organisms have, have complement. And for the most part, it works pretty much like it does in man, 
and almost no one is missing any of the proteins, which is really kind of interesting in itself. Now, uh, but nobody has, has understood why. In other words, it's really been very unclear. In fact, as a person who's worked in Kamlin my entire life, for example, last week, the Journal of Immunology sent out with its, uh, with its uh, uh, magazine uh, a, a folder uh, that you could put up on the wall on innate immunity. And it has about 500 items on the folder. And Complement doesn't get listed. Uh, if you read the recent reviews on innate immunity, Complement is not actually in the review. They've just forgotten that it exists. Um, so, so it is always working. It seems to always be working well. And people have basically forgotten about it. Um, there's an aspect that I'm not going to be able to get into in this uh, relatively short lecture, which has to do with complement and the immune response. Uh, uh, Hans Ox here and, and I re uh, published a paper 30 years ago <coughs> that pointed out that complement plays a very major role in the, in, a, in, the, in the early steps of the immune response. But nobody worries about it. And the reason nobody worries about it is no one's missing complement. It's not something you have to be concerned about. So let's talk about what people are concerned about. They have played, uh, they have made a, a considerable effort to understand how complement works um, from the effector side, and that is in protecting from infection. And they talk about three things. So on the top of this slide, number one, we have a primitive diplococcus, uh, like a gram-negative organism, and it can be lysed by complement. And so complement produces something in the surface of the bacterium, which looks like a, a, a cork or a hole. Uh, and the inside of the bacterium and the outside of the bacterium are in contact, and the bacterium can't live in that situation where it can't protect its internal milieu, and it dies. Even that's incorrect. We can talk about it later if people want to, but let's leave it at that. Number two is optimization. Complement deposits a series of peptides on the surface of something it's attacking. And those peptides interact with receptors on phagocytic cells, on mast cells, on almost every one of the sort of immune cells of the body. And in fact, in terms of phagocytes, you get what is called a zipper phenomenon, and the, fa and the, the bacterium or the virus gets phagocytized. That happens with HIV, so that was a matter of fact. Um, the third thing on the slide is that when complement gets activated, it generates a series of very small products, and those products turn on various aspects of, of the inflammatory response. The one I'm showing here is just one of them. The one I'm showing here is the one that we've known for the longest period of time, which is chemotaxis. If one of the complement proteins, in this case C5, gets activated, a little fragment is made, and that fragment interacts with phagocytic cells, and you can sort of see the phagocytes here, um, and, it, and it causes changes in the phagocytic cell. So in fact, the, the uh, nucleus uh, moves up to the front of the cell, it develops a ruffled border, it develops a lamellipod, and it moves toward the chemotactic stimulus. Now you can see why that might be useful. Uh, if you get a, uh, 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 an infection uh, and you get a, a, a piece of, of wood uh, uh, under your skin, um, it will activate complement. The, the phagocytes will come in. You'll get a little bit of uh, infection in the area, uh, and that will, in fact, lead to clearance since you have the, the um, uh, obscenization uh, going on. Now, people were fascinated for many years with this lysis phenomenon because it's so striking. But it turns out that lysis, in most cases, isn't very important. And this is simply a picture of the surface of a red cell. It's been known for many years. Uh, after complement has attacked the cell, and you see the holes or cork borer type structures. And here is a picture of, in fact, a fat droplet. And somebody has gone to the trouble of purifying the lesions that were shown in the previous slide. And all you have to do is, is shake them up with fat droplets. And in this case, they orient themselves in the fat droplet, as you can see. Now, this experiment, which was done a long time ago, um, was a very clever experiment, because what they did was they took a water-soluble electron-dense dye, and they put the fat droplets in the water-soluble electron-dense dye. Now, if you have a fat droplet and a water-soluble dye, it won't go inside the fat droplet. 
But if the fat droplet has picked up one of these lesions in the surface, if the water-soluble dye flows through the lesion into the fat droplet, showing exactly how complement lyses uh, a cell. So these kinds of things have been known for a long time. The other thing that's been known for a long time uh, is that when complement gets activated locally, and this is called an Arthas reaction, you get uh, a very, very typical picture. And that is the, that the antibody and complement, and, and the way you get an Arthas reaction, um, if this is a reverse Arthas reaction, the way you get an Arthas reaction is you take an animal and you give an antibody to something like uh, BSA or an allergen or whatever. And then you inject the antigen into the skin and, in fact, you see what happens. And what happens is that, in fact, the vessels dilate. They start to leak. Um, the, the, uh, the, the white cells start to line up and stick to the wall of the vessel. And you can see that happening here. The white cells then start to leave the, the, uh, the vessel, get into the skin. Um, and in fact, you can get a large area of necrosis. This has been a, known for a long time. Uh, and in fact, it's both FC receptors and complement that lead to the formation of this lesion. And it's still being studied. But this lesion would be called vasculitis by a pathologist. And in fact, complement and antibody play a role in the development of vasculitis. Okay. Now, we talked about complement, and there's no way that we can go through this lecture without it becoming fairly complicated, and I'm very sorry. I, I'm sorry for both myself and for you. Uh, the, the, uh, but there are three pathways of complement activation. Uh, the one in the middle is called the classical path, and it's called the classical pathway because it was discovered in the late 1800s, so it's been known for a very long time. And the people who discovered it were interested in how antibody works. They had this just in the process of discovering antibody. They were just in the process of understanding immunization. Uh, and they wanted to know what antibody does to protect you. And they found complement and they named it as uh, a heat labile stuff that works with antibody to lice cells or bacteria. That was the name, and it was called the classical path. Then they started to ask the question, well, how does it work? Uh, and they discovered a series of proteins, which are shown on this slide, um, starting with C1, which binds to antibody. And then you get these numbered proteins. Only one of the numbers is out of order, which was, and they were numbered in the order they were discovered. So that's actually kind of a lucky break. Uh, but be that as it may, you go through to a protein called C3, uh, and then you go through the late component C5 to 9, and you get lysis. So number one on this slide, like number one on the earlier slide, is lysis. Now it turns out that C3 is the principal opsonin in serum. Opsonin means covering with something that phagocytes recognize, and C3 turns out to be very important in opsonization, and we just talked about the fact that, that C5 is the most important chemotaxin, but complement causes all kinds of cytokine release and it hasn't really been studied in any detail. Now, the other point that's made on this slide, and I made it earlier, is that the complement pathway, in terms of evolution, is much older than the antibody pathway. And there are three pathways of activation. There's something that's act called the lectin pathway at the top of the slide. Lectins are things that bind to sugars, and most bacteria and most viruses are coated with sugars. And the lectin pathway evolved to bind to those sugars uh, and basically in the absence of antibody. Remember, there was no recognition other than the lectin uh, bind to the sugars. It would activate a series of proteins, which, as you see, all go through C3, but by different ways. And the major pathway goes through C4. It took a long time. In fact, one of the interesting things is that the classical pathway was found in the 1800s. The lectin path, well, the, the alternative pathway, which I'm going to talk about next, was first described by a man named Pillimer in the 1950s, but it really wasn't worked out until the 70s and 80s, so we're getting closer to the present time. Um, and the lectin pathway is still being worked out now. So we're talking about a very slow evolution of, of knowledge. But the alternative pathway does also not require antibody to get going. Most people think it was the first pathway, but that's not even clear uh, to evolve. 
um, and um, and it, it 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 focuses on C3. C3 goes through incredibly complicated metabolic changes that allow it to, and it, it slowly activates in plasma, and it allows it to bind to the alternative pathway factors to make a protein that will cleave more C3 and go from C5 to C9 and the lysis and all the other steps that we talked about. Now, antibodies activate complements. And one of the interesting things that, again, you don't hear much about is the fact that we got an awful lot of different kinds of antibodies. We've got IgM, we've got IgG, we've got IgA, we've got uh, uh, Ig IgA doublets with J-chain, et cetera, on this slide. And the different kinds of antibody activate complement in different ways. And nobody's really worked out the reason. So, for example, IgM, which is what natural antibody is composed of for the most part, only activates the plasma pathway. IgA only activates the alternative pathway. IgG, depending on the class and subclass, will activate one, the other, or both. Uh, and many IgGs activate both. And an interesting thing is, I don't know whether IgD D activates complement, and I know that the textbooks will tell you that IgE does not activate complement, but I can show you papers that say that it does. Uh, and I don't think anybody really knows. Um, partly because they don't know what the whole story is about. Why do you have these different kinds of antibody? Why uh, does IgG4 go up when people are being treated with, uh, with uh, peanut allergen? Uh, and that's a correlate of protection. Uh, but nobody knows what IgG4 does or why it goes up. Now, I wanted to show you this slide because I think it's really... this few slides, because I think they're, they're, they're telling you something that I don't think people know. Um, this is the killing of a particular E. coli that happens to be sensitive to antibody and complement, the kind of thing that people discovered in 1890. So you have here percent survival against percent serum of the bacterium in the presence and the absence of antibody. Okay, so the dotted line is in the absence of antibody, and you see that there's a little sensitivity uh, to serum, but not much. But you add antibody, and the organism is, organism is killed very quickly by complement. Heated serum will not kill this organism. Okay. Now, this is the uptake of C3, that central component, and the uptake of C9 on that E. coli when the organism is killed, and it requires every one of those proteins to kill the organism in the presence of antibody. And the interesting thing is there's no difference in the amount of C3 and C9 that goes on the organism that's killed and the organism that isn't killed. How can that be? The answer is that antibody does not just activate complement, which is what everybody thinks. It tells the complement where to go. And that will determine whether the complement is effective or not. So that if the organism is still active, just activating complement won't get hurt. It has to be binding the complement in a place that's going to cause trouble. And here's another experiment that we did a long time ago with Peter Rice um, that points that out in a more, um, in an even more interesting way. If this is a gonococcus, and it turns out that everybody has blocking antibody to the gonococcus <coughs> in their circulation. Um, and in fact, the blocking antibody blocks lysis. So in fact, the dotted line shows the increasing amounts of, of, uh, of uh, the blocking antibody, and in fact, this is FAB, it's activating the alternative pathway, but this is increasing amounts of blocking antibody. And as you can see from the dotted line, it constantly decreases the amount of lysis of the gonococcus. Shown on the same slide is the binding of C3. And in fact, as you're blocking the lysis of the cells, you're actually picking up more and more C3. It's going to the wrong place. It's actually protecting the organism. And we talked about um, the fact that these monoclonal antibodies don't work. One of the things about IgG that people have forgotten is that for an antibody to work, if it's IgG, it has to work in the form of doublets. Monoclonal antibodies only recognize one determinant, and most proteins do not have just one determinant. Uh, this is a fun series of experiments that I came across as I was 
uh, putting together this lecture. They're, they're experiments that I knew about, but this is a cryptococcus. And the only point of this slide is to show you that this cryptococcus has on its surface polysaccharide. And the polysaccharide is shown as a fluorescent molecule. It's wall to wall. The cryptococcus is completely surrounded by, by uh, polysaccharide. Now, if you're completely surrounded by polysaccharide, a monoclonal antibody can indeed form a doublet. So, in fact, people were not thinking that, but they wanted to know how the cryptococcus uh, uh, preserves its, its life. Uh, and so they made series, using the modern molecular techniques, they made series of antibodies with different FC fragments that would have different ability uh, to activate these various systems. So this, and this is a complicated slide, I'm sorry, I took it from this paper, but it's an old paper, you can see it's from 1998, um, uh, and, uh, and basically I just wanted to point out one thing, and that is that if you took a mouse, in this case, and you gave it cryptococcus, if you look at the non-complement activating antibody, the red uh, arrow on the left, you see that the animal died very, very quickly. If you took the very same antibody and you changed its FC fragment so that it, it, uh, it now had complement activating activity, uh, the mouse was protected to a major extent. And you can see that on the right. There's a tremendous amount of protection that's provided by complement activation. Okay, nothing very surprising here. It's a nice demonstration of what you want to see. Now here's a more recent paper. It came out in 2007 uh, from Sherry Morrison's laboratory. And she was, in fact, in this case, using human antibodies and doing exactly the same experiment and getting exactly the opposite result. And that is she had monoclonal antibody, it was a different monoclonal antibody, and changed the FC fragments. And lo and behold, to her surprise, the complement activating antibody caused the animals to die quickly and the non-complement activating antibody was protected. So here we have two experiments published nine years apart that are almost exactly the same experiment with almost exactly the opposite results by 180 degrees. And the answer is that antibody tells the complement where to go. And if it goes to the wrong place, you get protection of the organism. And if it goes to the right place, you get killing of the organism. And so that's an important point that this big company did not know and was not aware of. Now, the, the next thing I wanted to, uh, to get to is this, this whole business of the CH50 and the AH50. So basically, I think you all know, everybody taking boards in allergy knows that the CH50 is a measure of classical and lectin pathway activity. If your CH50 is zero, you're missing one of the proteins along that line. Uh, and so therefore, you have a patient with a complement deficiency. If your AH50 is zero, it's called AH50 because it's measuring the alternative pathway, and they actually use rabbit red cells instead of sheep red cells, which is used for the uh, CH50. Uh, if that's zero, it means something's wrong with the alternative pathway. If both are zero, it means C3, 5, 6, 7, 8, or 9 are not present. So that's what, what Dr. Buckley was talking about uh, at that time. But it turns out that that's not going to be very important. The number of people walking around with a CH50 of zero or an AH50 of zero is exceedingly few. This slide, unfortunately, is a more likely story. Uh, and I said that I was not going to try to make this as hard as I can, but now I have no choice. So what we have here is in blue and red and the lightning bolts all the places where complement is controlled. And the reason is that complement turns over very rapidly in the resting state. So we're talking about all these proteins, and they almost all turn over at about the rate of 2% per hour. So everyone in this room has proteins turning over at about 2% per hour. They're getting activated, and they can do a lot of damage. They can damage your kidneys, they can damage your joints, they can give you vasculitis, they can do a lot of damage. So there is a lot of effort in the body's system to turn off the proteins and make sure they're only being activated under appropriate circumstances. So all of the control proteins in red are actually sitting on cell membranes. Every cell in your body has a control protein sitting on it that prevents complement activation and damage to your own cells. 
and all the things in blue are circulating. Now, the reason that this is so important is that they have nothing to do with the CH50 or the AH50, and it turns out that these control proteins are really it turning out to be really important in disease, and no one is really capable so far of studying them in detail. There may be two laboratories in the world uh, that are capable of studying all these proteins in detail. Part of the story comes from C1 inhibitor. You remember, and you're going to hear more from Bruce Zero. Um, and, and, and again, I have to thank the Diex people for putting up with me. Um, but but uh, you will learn about hereditary angioedema. Now remember, hereditary angioedema is a heterozygous disease. People have 50% of the protein that they need. It's just not enough to keep them from getting disease. You'll hear more about it from Bruce Zero, but it turns out that that's true for almost all of these other proteins as well. Uh, and so, in fact, hmm, let me go back. Um, and so, in fact, um, the, the, uh, if you're heterozygous for these proteins, they may not be protective. And not only that, but as people have learned more about them, it turns out that there are polymorphic variants where one amino acid is changed and it increases or decreases the activity of these proteins. I didn't mention the little lightning bolts on the slide, but in all, all the places where you see a lightning bolt, if you put that protein on and you make a complex, it isn't stable, it decays over time. And again, it's an attempt to keep you from basically destroying all of your own cells. And so, in fact, there are all of these control factors. And another thing that's of great interest is that almost all those organisms and all the bacteria uh, uh, are binding some of these control proteins to prevent them from getting hurt. So almost every bacterium binds, for example, factor H. Factor H is a factor that controls complement activation and tries to help kill it on the surface of the cell. And so there are dozens of papers now saying this microorganism or that microorganism, and HIV is one of them, binds factor H to prevent lysis. I can't remember why I put that slide in. Oh, yes, I know. I want to go through the pathways a little bit. So this is the, the, the red is the classical pathway. And I just want to remind you about how those pathways work. Uh, but we're not going to spend a lot of time on that. This is C1Q, and C1Q is the thing that recognizes antibody. The little circles at the end of the, of the chains uh, attach to the FC fragment of antibody um, and transmit that information to two other proteins that are associated with it, RNS, and it goes and sets off the classical pathway. In the lectin pathway, we have a protein that's very similar. In this slide, it's shown as MDL. There are actually other proteins that work as well. And they set off a series of proteins called membrane, uh, mannose binding lectin associated serine proteases. They do exactly the same thing that C1 does. And this is a picture of C1Q on the left and mannose binding lectin on the right. And you can see how easily they might evolve from one another. The mannose binding lectin has those little green things at the end which bind to sugars and the C1Q has those circles on the end that bind to the FC fragment of antibody, but they look an awful lot alike. And the alternative pathway, as I said, is much more complicated because, in fact, it involves C3, and yet it activates C3. And because of that funny association, uh, it took almost a decade for very good protein chemists to figure out how this how this uh, uh, pathway works, and we still think that there are things we don't understand. Now, this is a slide I really didn't want to show, uh, but I couldn't figure out a way to get out of it. Uh, so this is C3, and C3 on the top of the slide is shown as a two-chain molecule with an alpha chain and a beta chain. And if you look at the center of the molecule, the center of the alpha chain, you see a thiol ester. Here it is with the arrow an S and a CO attached to one another, and it's buried in the molecule. There is no receptor in the body for C3. So it's not like IgG. Uh, C3 circulates, and it circulates in large amounts in your serum. Uh, it actually is 1.2 or 1.3 milligrams per mil. Uh, and so it circulates in your serum, and there's no receptor for it. When it gets activated, C3A comes off, and that's shown in red. I wish I had a little bit better point of it. 
not doing too well. Here, here's C3A, leaving behind most of the molecule, disulfide link and interchain disulfide, etc. But there's a break in the thiol ester, and this allows covalent detachment via R to a bacterium or a virus or your cells in a bad situation. And then the factor H that I told you about and factor I come along and you see the first red arrow, which leads to a break in the alpha chain, and you wind up with a protein called IC3B, inactive C3B. It will not continue the complement cascade. Now C3B, the second one down, with the, with the C3A off, does have receptors. And those receptors, as you see, are on B cells, follicular dendritic cells, dendritic cells, and phagocytes. And they're important in the initial stages of the immune response. And in fact, this antigen sitting on follicular dendritic cells via the C3B receptor uh, that's responsible for continuing uh, the immune response. Again, everybody has it, nobody worries about it. Um, the third thing down, IC3B, uh, is interesting because children with leukocyte adhesion deficiency are missing the receptors for IC3B, and IC3B is, in, and those, uh, is important as an opsonin. So in fact, although it does not continue the complement cascade, it's an important opsonin. And one of the things, as you see in red here, is that factor H is important and factor I, and I made a whole long list of bacteria in this case that bind factor H spontaneously from serum to sort of protect themselves. And then the final thing at the bottom of the slide is uh, a protein that's called C3BG. As you see from the small arrow, it actually separates the middle piece of the alpha chain from the rest of the uh, C3, and it is called C3D or C3DG. And there's a different set of receptors that recognize this, and it's the C3D receptors that are most important in the immune response. And again, Hans Ox here has worked on that um, and, and made some important contributions showing that what is true in animals is true in man as well. Now, bacteria have figured out, they've been around for a long time, and so they figured out what's going on. It turns out that on the left you see a normal cell, and the normal cell has on its surface sialic acid, which I've shown as red circles. And what happens is, if you have C3D deposited on a normal cell with the sialic acid, it attracts factor H and I, and the cell is protected. You get no further activation because, in fact, the H and the I make the C3B go to IC3B. On a bacterium, the C3B winds up in what is called the protected site. What it really means is it can't bind H and I, and therefore the bacterium is not protected and all of the things that we talked about at the right bottom of the slide, all the phagocytic things, etc., cetera, uh, come along and kill the bacterium. Now, if a bacterium is living uh, in our bodies or around us for, for, for eons, it learns that this is not a good situation from the bacteria's point of view. And so bacteria develop capsules that in fact have sialic acid. And so if the bacterium in this case has the red circles on its surface, sialic acid, in fact, it does exactly what your cells do, and it prevents complement from damaging the bacteria. And I've made a list on the bottom right of some bacteria that have developed sialic acid in their capsules. And those bacteria are protected from complement destruction. You need just general complement will not destroy this. In fact, the most pathogenic of the E. coli, K1, is a solid sialic acid capsule. Okay, so now we talked about C5A, and I'm not going to continue talking about C5A, except to make the point that this is a rabbit lung, uh, and you can see blood in the, in the uh, vessel of the rabbit lung, and then somebody's given C5A to the rabbit. And what you see when the rabbit dies of the C5A injection is that the vessels in the lung are filled with white cells, and the white cells stick together. So C5A is called an anaphylatoxin. If you inject it under the skin, you get a wheel and flare. If you inject it intravenously, you get this kind of thing, and you can kill an animal. The way this was described originally was by a guy named Phil Craddock, who noticed that patients who were put on dialysis machines sometimes got pulmonary problems. And in fact, in working this out, he discovered 
that in fact the complement system in the patients couldn't tell the difference between a bacterium uh, and the cellulose used to, to make a dialysis membrane uh, or a heart-lung machine membrane, and therefore we're activating complement. And so now we change the cellulose so that it's not a complement activator, but in fact, complement can contribute to anaphylaxis. Now, when I was in training and until a few years ago, I was taught that complement has absolutely nothing to do with allergy. Uh, if you read Marsha Carp, uh, Will's Carp, or some of the other more recent work, you find out the complement has a lot to do with remodeling in the lung, and it looks like it has a lot to do with determining whether you have a Th1 or a Th2 response. Um, there aren't many people who study complement. And so Marsha Wills Karp, when she was working in Cincinnati, had to bring over somebody from Germany um, to, to actually work with her. And then when he went back to Germany, she stopped studying compliments. So I haven't seen anything recent by her. Uh, Len worked with, with uh, uh, Ralph Snyderman, and this is one of his pictures, and I couldn't resist putting it in. Uh, this shows uh, 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 on the right a milliform membrane. So you can see the top of the membrane at the bottom. Uh, and on the left, you see what happens if you put phagocytes at the top of the membrane, and they slowly start to work their way through the membrane. If you put C5A under the membrane, as shown on the right, the phagocytes go through much faster, and they start to fall off the bottom. It's a chemotactic factor. It makes phagocytes come toward it. So C5A causes chemotaxis. It causes upregulation of adhesion molecules. It causes the release of pro-inflammatory cytokines, and I've listed a few of them there. And it causes mast cell degranulation. And again, not a lot of work being done in understanding this. There are really very, very, very few people uh, who are studying any aspect of this. You know that C5 through 9 defects, although they're rare, are associated with Neisseria infections, and that's part of the boards. Someone will ask that question on the boards at allergy. Uh, uh, and presumably that means that lysis is important for Neisseria, that is meningococcus and gonococcus organisms. And if you're missing those proteins, you will get repeated infections with those organisms. And in fact, it's an easy way to pick up five through nine, and I've seen one or two of those patients. I wanted to go through uh, another <laughs> series of experiments uh, having to do with infection, and then I want to come back to this control protein business. This is the surface of a gram-negative organism. Um, and what you can see, and again, uh, is that it has a cytoplasmic membrane, just like a regular cell, and I'm showing that with the arrows. And then there's a space, and it has something called peptidoglycan in that space, which is a complex sugar. And then it has a cell wall. And the cell wall is associated with these little fimbria that stick out, uh, uh, and uh, has pores and other things to let in nutrients. So that's the surface of a gram-negative organism. And in fact, in general, the surface contains lipopolysaccharides. You've heard of that. And the lipopolysaccharides in most of these pathogenic organisms have what is called a long polysaccharide side chain with, with uh, over-repeating units uh, that come out from the core polysaccharide as shown on the top of this slide, attached to lipid A. And if you have a semi-rough organism, it has a little of this, and if you have a rough organism, there's a defect in the core polysaccharides, so you don't get these old polysaccharide side chains. Now, it turns out that this organism is easy to kill, and this organism really hard to kill. And most of the pathogenic bacteria are like the one at the top. Why is that? And let me show you some experiments that we did. So, Years ago, we took a sensitive and a resistant um, E. coli, uh, actually this was a salmonella, um, and basically the sensitive one, as you see, as you add increasing serum, gets killed in its typical S-shaped curve. And in fact, the resistant one doesn't get killed at all uh, with even 80% serum. And we asked a simple question, what happens with the complement in this situation? Uh, and the answer that came out is a big surprise. This is the organism that gets killed. It fixed from serum over time a little bit of complement. And this is five, seven, and nine. And you can see that there was a little bit of complement fixation during this period of time, not very much. The organism that didn't get killed fixed every bit of five, seven, and nine we gave to it. So in fact, it depleted the serum of complement while it was totally resistant to lysis. I wanted to show you these because I don't think anybody knows about it, and certainly the people at this big drug company didn't know about it. 
So now here's consumption and binding of C3 by the two organisms, the resistant one and the sensitive one. And in fact, first of all, here's consumption, and they both consume about the same amount of C3 uh, in these, uh, the way we set up the study. And this is the binding to the cell surface of those of C3. So this is the one that gets killed, and this is the one that doesn't get killed. It binds twice or three times as much C3 to the surface, even though it's fine. Then we started to look at it a little more carefully, uh, and this is C9. And what we found was that the one that gets killed binds C9 and really holds on to the C9. And the one that doesn't get killed when it gets the binding of C9 starts shedding it from the surface. And in the next slide, uh, you can see an even cleaner experiment. And that is what we've done is we've looked at the binding of C7 in C8 deficient serum. So C8 comes obviously after C7. So you go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and you can't go to eight. So we're looking at the binding of C7 in C8 deficient serum. And I showed you in pooled normal human serum, you get binding and then it starts to fall off. If you do the same experiment in C8 deficient serum, what you get is C7 binds on that organism that's not going to get killed and falls off very slowly and much more C7 binds. If you add C8, all of a sudden the C7 starts to come off. And if you add physiologic amounts of C8, it mimics the curve with whole C7. So what's going on here? And it's shown very simply here. If you have the kind of organism that's not hurt, those long polysaccharide side chains pick up the complement and prevent it from doing any damage to the membrane. If, on the other hand, you don't have those long polysaccharide side chains, the complement can get inserted into the membrane and kill the organism. So, in fact, the organisms have figured out a very sensitive way of protecting themselves. Okay. Um, they also have two other strategies that they've used. And remember, these organisms are still killing us. That's the reason we're having all this trouble with antibiotics. So here is the thing that I showed you before. The very sim simple serum-sensitive organism is killed. If you put a big peptidoglycan sugar layer here, the complement is still bound. But now it can't penetrate the membrane, and it doesn't do any damage. And so, in fact, gram-positive organisms, which have this big peptidoglycan layer, <coughs> don't get hurt. The other mechanism that these organisms use is the one that I've shown you here at the bottom of the slide. I talked about the zipper business and I talked about the complement protein being deposited and, and interacting with the phagocyte. If the organism, whoops, that didn't, wasn't one that I did. Uh, if the organism puts a, 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 in yellow a, a, a capsule there, the complement can still be deposited. It goes right through the capsule, but the organism is not hurt. And so it can't feel the complement proteins, and therefore it can't phagocytize. And one of the things that we've done is evolve antibody. We're constantly trying to figure this out. So at the top, I show you the, the, white, the uh, yellow capsule, and I show you that in the alternative pathway, the primitive pathway, the complement dot got deposited on the cell wall, and the capsule prevented the uh, organism from being damaged. We make antibody. And so the antibody is shown in blue at the bottom of the slide. It causes complement to be deposited on the capsule. And you know you get antibody to polysaccharide um, for pneumococci, etc. It causes complement to be on the outside, and therefore the organism gets phagocytized. That's why the antibody protects us. Now, I just put in a few slides, which I'm going to go through very quickly because I see time is limited. I do want to talk about this uh, other area of protection in some greater detail. But here is a type 7 pneumococcus. Simply, this slide simply shows that the antibody to type 7 pneumococcus binds to the type 7 pneumococcus shown in blue. Um, it doesn't bind to a rough pneumococcus shown in red, and it doesn't bind to a bunch of other organisms that are in pneumococci, shown at the bottom of the slide. This is what antibody, IgM antibody, does to the clearance of those type 7 organisms. So, the yellow is the organism without any antibody. The blue line is the organism with 120 mo molecules of IgM per organism. The red line is 240, and the, and the squares uh, at the bottom are 500. So it does not take very much IgM to activate complement and destroy the organism 
And so IgM is very effective at activating the, the uh, classical pathway. I won't show you all the controls because it's in our lecture itself. If you take, uh, a, a, in this case, a C4 deficient guinea pig, which we had developed, and do the same experiment with a 1,000 molecules of IgM, there's no clearance. And the reason is the complements required for clearance uh, of this particular bacterium with this particular, um, uh, uh, in, in these particular experiments. The details of the experiments are very essential. Uh, if you do the same experiment with IgG antibody, you see, first of all, that 500 molecules of IgG don't make any difference in clearance whatsoever. So IgG is much less efficient than IgM. But by 2,000 and 5,000 molecules, you're getting pretty good clearance, and it's pretty much the same. If it's anti-capsular antibody, you get clearance. If it's anti-cell wall antibody, it goes right through the capsule, and 15,000, 40,000 molecules of IgG don't do anything. So the specificity of the antibody is very important, and it also is important in determining what happens to those bacteria. In this slide, what I'm showing in blue is the number of bacteria that get cleared by the liver, and in red, the number that get cleared by the spleen. If you take complement out of the equation, you get less clearance, but also the spleen becomes much more important. And if you preopsonize the organisms with antibody, you move the balance back to where it was in the first place. The point about this is that people with splenectomy are very sensitive to getting killed by microorganisms, and this is one of the reasons. Complement pushes the organism to the spleen, and if you don't have a spleen, you're in big trouble. Okay, now I want to get back and, and end the few minutes talking about what's really new, uh, and which is both confusing and important. The, the, first of all, we've known for a while that complement receptors are used by certain, particularly viruses, to get into cells. And that is, if you have all these cells with complement receptors at them, and the viruses are evolving over time, uh, they use some of these receptors to get into cells. After all, they're there in all your cells. You might as well, um, uh, from the virus's point of view, you might as well use them to your advantage. So what I'm showing you here is a cell membrane in the, in the middle of the slide, and I'm showing you these circles because, in fact, these complement modules um, are present on almost all of these protective uh, 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 molecules on the surface of a cell. So on the left is one called DAF, decay accelerating factor. In the middle is one called MCP, membrane cofactor protein. On the right is CD35. Um, and, uh, and then uh, on the far right is CD59. What are all these proteins? Well, first of all, most of the protective proteins have these complement modules that bind to complement and therefore do what they're going to do. The K accelerating factor makes those little um, lightning bolts that I showed you earlier go faster. So it works on the, on the uh, uh, C3 convertase of the alternative and the classical pathway to make it go away faster. So it, it accelerates the decay. Membrane cofactor protein does not do that. It acts on C3, it binds C3, and as shown by the arrow um, on that slide where it says cofactor for I, it causes the cleavage of C3. So it's not going to be a big complement activator. CD35, which is present on all your red cells and most of your phagocytes, and in fact on B cells as well, and dendritic cells, does both. As you can see on this slide, ECHO has decided to bind to, C to DAF directly to get inside cells. Measles binds to MCP directly to get inside cells. West Nile virus binds to CR3, uh, that's CD18, uh, CD11C, to get into cells, and I've shown you CD59. So I'm back to these, to these slide that I showed you before. And what I'm saying is that we have all of these protective molecules and the organisms have found ways of using them to get into cells or to protect themselves. So that's one aspect of things. Now the other aspect of things, it's turned out to be very important. I mentioned the fact that C1 inhibitor doesn't have to be totally gone before you have hereditary angiopenia. Well, it turns out that these other molecules don't have to be totally gone before you get into trouble. 
And this has turned out to be very important, and you're going to hear a lot more about it over the next few years. And what's more, you're going to be the only people in the medical center who understands. So you got to, let's talk about hemolytic uremic syndrome, which is a disease of children um, in which they get hemolysis and renal disease, and it can be lethal. It's what happened with Jack in the Box here years and years ago. Now, there's a kind called atypical hemolytic uremic syndrome, where, in fact, you don't even need the bacteria to get it started. And that's what people have focused on in most of their studies, although there are some people saying that, you, that even hemolytic uremic syndrome, general hemolytic uremic syndrome, works the same way. So this is a very complicated slide. So what I'm showing you first in the middle of the slide is a very large C3B. Hemolytic uremic syndrome of this sort turns out to be a syndrome in which you're making far more C3 than you're supposed to. And so, in fact, it's far harder to control. And the way you make the C3 is determined by many, many factors. So, for example, if you have a defect in the way factor H works or factor I works, and both have been described, you don't turn off the C3B. You don't cause the cleavage that I showed you earlier in a slide, and therefore you make more C3. Antibody to factor H or factor I turns out to be present in some people, and that turns off this, the factor H and I, and again, you get more C3B. A problem with CD46, and that is the membrane cofactor protein, also does not turn off C3B as well as it should, and therefore you get more C3B. And finally, it turns out that there are gain-of-function mutations in both factor B and C3 itself that leads to more C3. Well, we've listed a whole bunch of problems that can lead to more C3B, and when you get more C3B and you don't turn it off, you get more uh, complement activation caused by the C3B, and you get hemolytic uremic syndrome. So, Increase in function of B or C3, decrease of destruction. Now, how do you find that out? It turns out that all these people have normal CH50s and normal uh, 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 normal uh, AH50s, and so it's hard. And with my last, well, uh, okay, so this is the last slide because I was going to tell you that now there's a disease of man, uh, of elderly people called macular degeneration. And it turns out that the picture for macular degeneration looks just like this. They found exactly the same factors in macular degeneration. And macular degeneration is a major cause of blindness in the elderly. Uh, I mentioned last night that when I first looked up macular degeneration for one year uh, in PubMed, I found 3,000 papers. Uh, there's a lot of work going on in macular degeneration. And no one was interested in complement. And about five years ago, five different laboratories doing G total genome sequencing published in the same month or within a two-month period that they found that there was a defect in factor H that seemed to be responsible for much of the macular degeneration. And they didn't know how it worked, and they still don't know exactly how it works. But the picture that they show is exactly like this picture for hemolytic uremic syndrome. Now, the question is, how do you make those determinations in a particular patient? Uh, that's hard because the way they do it now is they sequence all of these genes to look for abnormalities, which is both expensive and difficult. And as far as I know, in America, only one laboratory is doing it. So, so that's, uh, that, that's a big problem. Uh, the other uh, major problem is the fact that what do you do about it? Now, it turns out that the fact that complement is important in lupus, for example, in damaging kidneys, and people understand all the complement uh, enzymes, they understand the sequence, they understand the enzymatic site. Not one drug company has tried to make a drug that blocks any of those pathways. They all felt that it was economically uninteresting, and I had one drug company tell, one guy actually tell me that if I work on that and it turns out to be a dud, I'm gonna get fired. But if I work on something that everybody else is working on and it doesn't work out, that's fine. And so I'm not going to work on it. And that was the answer. Well, now that it's turning out that, number one, uh, an anti-C5 has proven to be very effective. It's the only drug that works on complement that anybody's ever developed. Um, it's turned out to be economically very viable. And because of all this, I think in the next five years, you can see a lot, of, a lot of drugs, or at least a lot of new drug trials 
And as I say, I think the allergy community may be the only community that understands what's going on. Uh, so with those words, I think I'll stop. I'm sorry I'm a minute or two over. And uh, I'll say thank you again for the invitation. Yes. I have uh, maybe a couple of comments that will hopefully lead to question. We actually get quite a few consults on this, I think, as fellows, so I find it very pertinent. And I, I always struggle a little bit with how to work it up. And I think you're, you know, it's clear that a lot of these regulatory proteins are relevant to a number of immunologic diseases, maybe more on the sort of autoimmune, autoinflammatory right. side than the infectious. And I've also heard, I don't know this literature, but there's growing evidence um, there may be differences in expression of different complement proteins, maybe related to diseases like lupus and diabetes. Right. This is all a new concept. Yeah. And I think the, the genetic uh, location of C4, I think, is very near to HLA or something. And, and there's thought that maybe yeah, a lot C4 of C4 and C2 are called class 3 genes. They sit in the middle of the, of the, of the major histocompatibility complex, and nobody knows what they're doing there. Yeah, and maybe a, a lot of diseases that we previously linked to HLA is actually linked to the C4 and not to the HLA just because they're so yeah. nearby. Um, so my question is one, are, in some of those, like I think there's a thought that C4, relative C4 deficiency may contribute to lupus. Is anybody looking at, or for our pure complement deficiencies, replacement of any of these factors? Well, number one, replacement is basically impossible. Yeah, and that is that if the proteins turn over at 2% per hour, you're talking about uh, <laughs> basically giving a constant infusion. So that's not practical. Uh, it, what is practical is turning off some of these pathways. Uh, and no one's tried, as I said, no drug company has even been interested in developing drugs. So no one's even tried to do it. Uh, that should not be a terrifically difficult problem. Right. Now, the other point of this, though, is how do you make the diagnosis? And that turns out to be real trouble. Well, and that is, if you can't do a CH50, these are all normal CH50s, and you can't do an AH50, um, how do you know whether you're dealing with one of these abnormalities? And we're all wrestling with that at the present time. I can't do it in my lab. I can do one or two of the proteins. As I said, as far as I know, in America, there's only one laboratory that, uh, that's doing it, and it's doing it both by functional assays and sequencing eight of these proteins, and it's not even sequencing all of the proteins that are in, possible. In Denver, you're talking about? Um, no, it's in, in uh, Idaho. Oh, yeah. uh, the, but, and no one in Europe is doing it. So we're going to have to rethink the whole, I mean, Gene DX doesn't do it. So we're going to have to rethink uh, the whole way we worry about these diseases thinking that what we thought was totally unrelated to the complement may turn out to be very complement related. Uh, I will tell you another story, and that is that about a decade and a half ago, I was invited to go to a, um, a meeting at the NIH where they were going to talk about using monoclonal antibodies to treat hemolytic uremic syndrome. And uh, I asked them a very simple question. I said, you know, these antibodies probably don't activate complement because they're monoclonal antibodies, but has anybody checked? And the answer was, no, why would we bother checking? It has nothing to do with complement. So, and they never did check. So, so um, there, there are things that are sort of out of sight, out of mind, which may turn out to be really important. Uh, and basically, they've been on the back burner for a very long time. Follow up there. In terms of working it up, what I usually do is just send blood to Peggy uh, uh, Geekless's lab in uh, Patsy. Uh, Patsy, yeah. Patsy and, and, and she, but she can't do all this stuff. All right. So where? What do you do? Where do you send blood when <laughs> have you know uh, atypical hemolytic uremic syndrome or, or well, these sorts of number problems? one, I avoid getting into that position yeah. assiduously. Uh, secondly, there is a one place in 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 Idaho. Uh, uh, Iowa, where where uh, where they're doing it, uh, and the interest there uh, is actually in the um, in the otolaryngology department, and the reason that it's a, it's a man named Smith, and the reason that he's interested in his kid developed all this stuff, and his kid had to have a renal transplant, and a lot of these people who have renal transplants, depending on the abnormality. If it's an abnormality in a membrane-bound protein, then the renal transplant survives. If it's an abnormality in one of the serum proteins, 
it turns out that the renal transplant is treated just like your regular kidney and is destroyed. So it's of importance, and it was important to him. And so he started to, to work out these assays. Uh, and it, it's turning out to be fascinating. It's turning out that many of the diseases in which we have complement being deposited in kidneys are related to these abnormalities that nobody even knew existed. The, when Marshall Wills Carp was looking at the question on the complement and airway yeah. hyper-responsiveness, she took the mice that were unresponsive and then the mice were hyper-responsive, so like methicolin channels and all these multiple back processes, and she found, I forget which one, C3 or C5 was the key okay, one. So I'll, I'll be so, that. do you have any speculation why that would be so critical for airway well, hyper response? I didn't get into complement and the induction of the immune response. But it's very interesting. A lot of the people who have made major contributions to the field have no interest in complement whatsoever. And that was Marcia Will's car. Uh, she was interested in why certain species of mice develop uh, uh, hyper responsive airways and other species of mice don't when you give them uh, aerosolized antigen. Uh, and so she did total genome sequencing in a series of mice that got a hyper-responsive airway disease and a series that didn't. And the first thing she published was, to her amazement, it turned out to be C5 and it turned out backwards. And that is, you'd say, well, if C5A causes anaphyla anaphylaxis and C5... So C5 deficient animals should have less anaphylaxis and C5 sufficient animals should have more. That's not what she found. She found exactly the opposite, that the C5 sufficient animals had the, uh, no anaphylaxis and the C5 deficient animals had. So then she started, she got a guy from Germany who knew something about complement, uh, and they started to work on this. And what they found with C5 was that it determines whether you make a Th1 or a Th2 response, that the C5 uh, presence was causing the immune response to the antigen, which was being aerosolized, to be more Th1, and therefore the animals didn't get anaphylaxis. Now, she's published subsequent papers, which have looked at both C5 and C3, and she finds that C3 does exactly the opposite. If C3 fragments are being formed, uh, you wind up with, with uh, uh, moving the immune response toward a Th2 response, and if they're not being formed, uh, you get a Th1 response. Uh, and so when I spoke to her last, which was a couple of years ago, uh, she said that, that she thought that the drugs that she was hoping to see developed were all C3-dependent, uh, that they would work before C5. The other thing that's been found is if you don't have any C5A receptors, you have abnormalities in modeling of the lung, and you have yeah, abnormalities in the in the ability to develop a, a hypersensitive airway disease. So the complement during the inductive phase of the immune response is doing something different than it does if once you've got antibody and once you've got a Th1 or a Th2 response, and therefore you're getting a, a response in your airways. So this is not clear. As I said, she was not a complementologist. She brought somebody from Germany to do it. He's gone back to Germany. And she's not working on that anymore. Well, Michael, why don't we take a brief break okay. and uh, get a cup of coffee. Okay. I encourage as many people as possible to stay. And then we'll present a case and okay. shift topics to Andrew with you. Okay. Oh. Well, it's a complicated subject. Just got back from Yeah, I'll settle. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're all trying to go to college education.
sometimes associated with shortness of breath and wheezing. She requires emergent care and uh, rare intubation on these occasions. She was referred to Dr. Dooms from her PCP in January of 2010. Mm -hmm. Her past medical history is significant for panic attacks, anxiety disorder, uh, ADD, and then OCD with agoraphobia. So a little bit of a psych history. With this. <laughs> uh, her current medications when she saw Dr. Dooms included EpiPen, prednisone, cetirizine, Adderall, Ritalin, and then Ativan for her panic attacks. Uh, the patient states so that she had stopped all of these medications for several weeks after the angioedema had occurred and she had no improvement ever since. So January through September 2012, she was followed by Dr. Dooms. Uh, basically, on her first presentation, she had a normal physical exam, except for questionable and large lips, but nothing overtly normal. She had allergy skin prick testing, which was negative, autoimmune urticaria workup, and angioedema workup, all by Dr. Dunes, and all of them were negative. At some point in his evaluation, there was concern for BCD, because sometimes she would present with these acute onsets of shortness of breath that didn't seem to be related to just the lip swelling. Um, however, that also was negative, and then there was some possible 
concern for cosmetic injections to the lips that was brought up by other people and the patient denied that she was having this done. Uh, at this point, Dr. Dooms recommended speech therapy for possible VCD and a request for the patient requested an evaluation at NAC Seattle. So she comes to us at NAC on September 20th, 2012. At this point, her episodes occur as frequently as every other day, and the longest angiogenic free period since 2009 has been about three weeks. Uh, currently, her treatment was consisting of EpiPen and steroids, and she noticed no benefit while well. She had no family history of angioedema, no new findings on exam, and repeat labs were continuously formed. So labs when she first presented showed normal CDC, differential, normal electrolytes, normal liver function tests. Her C1 INH function was 90%, protein level was 12, and the C4 serum level was 25 all pretty much in the middle of so at that point Dr. Altman started her on Danazol at 200 milligrams twice daily and uh, fears her as needed and someone went to her home and showed her how to do the self injections she returned to us about a month later on October 3rd and she stated that she had decreased frequency of symptoms she had been angioedema free for three weeks while on the Danazol and therefore she was continued on Danazol 200 milligrams for the next four months. Uh, she noticed decreased frequency, but did suffer an attack requiring Fierzer injection in December of 2012, and this occurred while she was on vacation and had to present to an outside emergency department. Again, repeat labs on follow-up showed no abnormalities after this event, and in February of 2013, Danazol was increased to 200 milligrams three times a day because of this severe episode. A phone call was. She does. So when she uses a fear there, her symptoms resolve. Uh, in February 20th, 2013, there was a phone call and ultimately a follow up because the patient stated that after she increased the Danazol, she developed a generalized rash. Um, unfortunately, we were not able to see the rash when she presented, but she did request to stop the Danazol because she associated that with the rash. At that point, Dr. Allman switched her to progesterone, 200 milligrams daily. And on March, uh, at follow-up, she did have some visible lip swelling at the appointment, but that had been her only episode in the last one or two months while on the progesterone. Um, it was noted on physical exam that the patient appeared to be pouting versus an actual uh, antibiotics. Then in June of 2013, uh, she was seen again by Dr. Altman. She was doing well, so she was continued on the progesterone 200 milligrams daily. The patient was probably the happiest. I think Dr. Altman had seen her. She had had 60% improvement of symptoms, but did have to use the fears are still on two separate occasions for tongue and face well. Uh, she states again her symptoms resolved rapidly after the injection. Uh, at this point, as I stated about the chronic ankle pain, um, she's having a lot of issues with chronic pain. Uh, and very concerned because surgeons won't operate on her ankle uh, due to these anti episodes. And so her, her main issue right now is trying to get to the point where she's stable enough to undergo surgery to help treat her problem. So some of the questions that we have for you today is, is this actually HA3? And if not, you know, what else is in the differential diagnosis? Um, and then does trauma initiate HA3 or have you heard of this phenomenon before? Are there any new diagnostic studies that we're not aware of? Uh, any other treatment options and preferences? And Matt, do you have a question well, before Dr. Oh, before you get an expert opinion, I comment one thing. There was a, a good presentation of the Quad AI last year about this idiopathic angioedema. They went through this paper, I was looking up from 2006, 800 cases of idiopathic angioedema and found causes for about 10%. And the most common was like chronic infection. So all of her episodes are face, head or neck, mm -hmm. right? I mean, what, what I've started doing is looking for, so dental granulomas, other dental or head and neck infections causing recurrent episodes of, of angioedema. And since this was started by trauma and multiple surgeries in the area, could she have something there or some osteomyelitis or some other 
chronic infection. I don't know if you think that's a valid possibility, but I remember that as a prominent thing from this paper that was presented. Yeah, that's reminiscent of the way we used to look at chronic idiopathic urticaria 20 years ago. People had indolent infection somewhere and looked for them and ultimately decided that it's not a valid way to go about it and you rarely find them. And even if you do find them, you haven't proven cause and effect. You just proven two different things. But Mike's our expert here. And <laughs> I don't know if you know what this woman has, and she's well. Oh, one the question I was to deal with. Yes. The lip injection. She get collagen. She get Botox. She denied. She denied it. everything. Oh, but she was. There getting, was suspicion. And again, this was at Dr. Jude's office. Oh. Well, first of all, if you have a, a referring physician called Dr. Doom. I consider him very <laughs> interesting. Well, he's a nice guy. Yeah. Uh, he just happens to be saddled with that name. He's probably, he's probably listening to it. Right, yeah. <laughs> I, don't know what to do. <laughs> I must say, it's a new one. Um, okay, so when I started working on hereditary angioedema years and years and years ago, the patients that I saw were really very standard. They had abdominal pain attacks, they had uh, peripheral swelling attacks, they often had those two sets of attacks that didn't occur together, and every once in a while they had an upper airway attack which could lead to um, uh, airway uh, closure and asphyxiation, and, and some of those, and that was actually what got me into hereditary angioedema. And we all know, I mean, it's, it's, it's now we all know that low C1 inhibitor and low C4 uh, make the diagnosis, uh, and we know how to treat it. Uh, and the drugs that we treated with really are fairly benign. Uh, Furazir, Calbitor, uh, uh, Baronir, uh, Sinrise, they're all relatively benign drugs, which have not had a lot of side effects, and so everybody's get, been giving it a try. When those drugs became available, all of a sudden, a group of patients arose that none of us knew even really clearly existed. And before I get to that, let me just say one other word about hereditary angioidine. When I started seeing patients with hereditary angioedema, the, the, um, the story was that it used to be called hereditary angioneurotic edema. And the reason it was called angioneurotic edema by William Osler and people like that, and very famous physicians, was that it was felt to have something to do with the nervous supply to the, to the skin. And therefore, with some abnormality of the nervous supply, you would get capillary leak and angioedema. We all laughed because we said that so many of the patients that we were seeing uh, had major psychological problems. Um, and um, and it, was, it was extremely common. So we laughed and said, we ought to go back to calling it hereditary angioneurotic edema because they're all neurotic. Um, and, and an interesting thing over the years is that as we've learned how to treat these patients, that part of the story has basically disappeared. The patients that I see now with standard hereditary angioedema are not neurotic <laughs> monsters. Part of the reason was that those early patients had often seen members of their family die of choking to death with a disease that was untreatable that they knew that they had. So this was a very different situation. The other thing that I think is important to get to before we get into this patient is the fact that if you go back and look at the studies that have been done, all of them, none of the drugs have been 100% effective in double-blind studies. Synrise was effective in about 60% of patients. That's a usual story. So that, in fact, in a double-blind situation where you're not sure whether the drug is going to work, you will wind up getting a fair number of patients who don't respond. When the drug is definitely approved and definitely working, in fact, many more patients respond. So it's very unusual to have a patient not respond with standard hereditary angioedema. Okay. So then about, I guess it must be seven or eight years ago now, maybe more, um, uh, Conrad uh, uh, Bork in Germany and uh, Al Davis in America published a group of patients that Bork called type 3 hereditary angioedema, and none of us know if that was a misnomer. 
and his patients um, were women, all women, who developed attacks of angioedema, and his original studies, and he sees all, he gets to see all the interesting patients in Germany, so it's one big center. Um, his original studies were family studies in which w people in, had the same um, inheritance pattern uh, as hereditary angioedema, with the exception that they were all women. So they tended not to skip generations and they tend to be female. Uh, Al Davis's patients uh, were fewer, uh, and, uh, and most of those patients were on birth control pills. And again, it was all women, uh, and they had a disease that looked exactly like hereditary angioedema. But these patients all had normal C1 inhibitor and normal C4, and so the pathophysiology was unclear. Now, Bork has had the most experience with, with, uh, and with what he called type 3 hereditary angioedema, and the name stuck. Um, and, um, and he's pointed out that it differs from standard hereditary angioedema in a number of respects. Number one, these patients have much fewer abdominal attacks. Number two, it starts at an older age. Hereditary angioedema often gets worse during puberty, and these patients often start later. Number three, it most often affects the airway and, and, um, and the upper part of the body rather than being standard hand and feet attacks, although standard hand and feet attacks occur. Um, so there are, there are physiologic differences between those patients and patients with hereditary angioedema. The problem is that as that diagnosis was made and as the internet uh, can, can disseminate information very, very quickly. A group of patients started to show up in all of our offices that we had no idea what was going on with and that we had no idea really existed. And these were people who claimed to have frequent angioedema attacks. They were all kinds of angioedema attacks. I got a letter this past week uh, from a doctor who had a patient who was having angioedema attacks in which the attack would have, would, of swelling would appear over 15 minutes. It would often affect the airway, but the upper part of the body. Um, and it, the attacks would last for several weeks before it disappeared. Uh, but we're seeing all these patients, and some of them clearly have what looks to be what we used to call Munchausen's disease, M meaning some of my patients are women who have who are nurses. Uh, I have one family where the woman is a nurse and the husband is an ENT technician, um, and they're absolutely convinced that they have type 3 hereditary angioedema when they walk into the office and they want to be treated. Now let's talk about treatment, because in fact, nobody has worked out the physiology so far of these kinds of angioedema attacks. And in fact, when the people who are expert in the field got together last summer, uh, what we decided was that we would not even call something type 3 hereditary angioedema unless one of two issues occurred. In Germany uh, and in Europe, they found that about 20 percent, it used to be said 30 percent of patients have a factor 12 abnormality in their gene, maybe a gain of function uh, mutation. The reason I'm putting all these qualifications uh, into it uh, is the fact that the people who originally said it was a gain-of-function mutation now say they're not sure it was a gain-of-function mutation, uh, but they did find a mutation. And a couple of other mutations have been found in factor 12. Now, one of the interesting things is that those mutations in factor 12 account for, first of all, only about 20% of patients. And what the mutation is doing isn't so clear. But it, what is clear is the fact that factor 12 can lead to the bradykinin pathway activation. And so, therefore, it makes some kind of sense that, that uh, you might have a, a factor 12 mutation. And Alan Kaplan has a recent paper in JACI, maybe last month, uh, looking at other ways that, 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 that this pathway can get activated. Um, the, the, um, the interesting thing to me about that is that the people at National Jewish, Patsy Jicklis, put in a series of assays, genetic assays, for these mutations. And they've only found two patients in all of the samples that they've been sent uh, 
that have that that series of mutations. And since most of the people in America are of European descent, it almost doesn't make sense. But be that as it may, she hasn't found very many. And the Germans first said about a third of patients, and now they're saying 20% of patients. And so it clearly can't be responsible for all of the patients with this illness. So the decision was made that, in fact, you can't even make the diagnosis without a family history. All you can say is it's non-histaminergic angioedema. That's the first thing. Um, and uh, and non-histaminergic only means that it doesn't respond to antihistamines and doesn't respond to steroids, uh, basically. Um, and so you, you're left with a grab bag of patients. Now, as I said, Bork has most of the experience with this disease. And I'll be seeing him in a week. But, but, um, but when I spoke to him last, which was not that long ago, um, he basically would treat the patients with either danazole or tranexamic acid. Tranexamic acid is a fibrinolysis inhibitor that early on, we did a double-blind study with EACA, epsilon amino caproic acid. And the reason we did that was because in Sweden, it had turned out that, uh, that some patients responded to it. And our double-blind study showed that the patients do respond to it. Um, Tranic, uh, I mean, that's an interesting story in itself uh, because um, the way that was discovered was that some surgeons in Sweden basically decided to treat every single patient with a bleeding disorder that they had on the surgical service with EACA just to see what would happen. You could never, ever get that by an IRB in today's uh, uh, world. And I've forgotten how many patients they treated, but it was either, either 500 or 700. Uh, so they treated uh, every, every single patient that came through with EACA, and they reported that one patient with hereditary angioedema seemed to get better. Um, that was repeated by Anna Britta Lorel's group in Sweden. Uh, and in fact, she confirmed it, and then we did a double blind study that showed that it works. EACA is a drug with a lot of toxicity, uh, particularly over time. Uh, and tranexamic acid is a circularized EACA, and it has two advantages. Number one, the toxicity is lower, and number two, the dosage is lower. You, you, uh, EACA in an adult, you use it about eight grams a day, so it's a very hard drug to take. Um, and, uh, and tranexamic acid you use at a much lower dose, two or three grams a day, um, and the toxicity is lower. And believe it or not, the Europeans don't publish so, so a, a double-blind study was done with tranexamic acid, which showed that it was effective in hereditary angioedema. But to my knowledge, no study has ever come out showing its toxicity in people. Um, originally, uh, there were studies that said that, that it caused colorblind abnormalities. But, but be that as it may, uh, it's supposed to be relatively low toxicity. And often, a man like Bork would use it as his first agent in one of these non-histaminergic angioedemas. Now, the next question is if a person really... Now, the reason we're saying you need a family history to make the diagnosis of type 3 is that we don't have any physiologic study that allows you to make the diagnosis of type 3. Uh, so everybody agrees that there must be a group of patients who have mutations, new mutations, just like there are in hereditary angioedema, that have type 3. But since we don't know how to make the diagnosis, and we know that if it's passed from generation to generation, it's a likely diagnosis, we basically say you can't make the diagnosis because of all of these people who are coming in who have think they have type 3, uh, who don't. The next thing about type 3 is nobody knows how to treat it exactly. Uh, tr as I said, Bork would use tranexamic acid and danazole as a start. He might try one of the newer agents. But his experience and my experience is that some people respond and some people don't. And we're probably dealing with different physiologic situations, but we don't understand when a person's going to respond. And some people respond sometimes and then they don't respond other times. And again, uh, that's important. Your patient here has a lot of psychological problems. Uh, and there is no question in my mind that, that anxiety and psychological problems increase the rate of attacks enormously in this patient group, even with standard hereditary angioedema. As I mentioned last night, I had a patient call me, um, uh, has been calling me on a regular basis, um, who, had, who was in a, an, an untenable 
situation with regard to her marriage, uh, having very frequent attacks of hereditary angioedema and trying to get them under control with only limited success. And this is, happens to be a person without very much money, um, and so it's a real problem for her. Um, that the psychological problems could make the angioedema worse in this kind of case, I have absolutely no doubt. The fact is that you said that progesterone helped her a lot. Uh, we talked about that last night, and I said that I tried a progesterone trial in hereditary angioedema, and all the patients felt better, uh, but their attack frequency did not go down. Um, and the fact is, I don't know that anybody's done a double blind trial of progesterone in type 3, and so it's an interesting observation. I think it's, it potentially is an important observation. Um, so what I'm saying is that making the diagnosis, it's hard. And even when you've made the diagnosis, knowing precisely what the patient ought to respond to is not always easy. Um, the other point to be made is that these patients have normal C1 inhibitor levels. And there's a tendency to give C1 inhibitor to these patients. Um, and one of my patients who was absolutely convinced that she had type 3 had had a perfect clinical history for type 3, except for the lack of family history. Um, and who I ultimately had major doubts at type 3 over time as I studied and followed this patient. Um, the, this patient managed to go back to, where, to her hometown and get repeated injections of Synrox to try to control her, in quotes, type 3. She had a port put in so that she could continue to get the Synrox, and she had developed a major thrombosis of her inferior vena cava. And so the point is that the, the guidelines now for even hereditary angioedema are say, try to keep away from ports. Uh, and the reason is that C1 inhibitor not only inhibits complement and not only inhibits the kinin generating system, but inhibits the fibrinolytic system. Uh, and there is no question that if you start using huge amounts of C1 inhibitor, you can get into a problem with thrombosis. If you go back to the original old literature, and there was not, there was never a paper published on this. It was only an abstract. In Germany, where C1 inhibitor was available for many, many decades before it was available here, some crazy cardiac surgeon decided to give huge amounts of C1 inhibitor to some children uh, that he was doing cardiac surgery on and managed to get thrombosis and kill some children and continued the study so that, in fact, he had a fair number of children that he killed and he wrote an abstract. Uh, the abstract has come out uh, in German, uh, but he never wrote a paper for reasons which I think I understand. Uh, and, um, and it was thrombosis. So if you want to do a study in children with C1 inhibitor, the FDA is very aware of that and wants you to do a complete thrombosis uh, uh, evaluation profile uh, on any child that gets C1 inhibitor, uh, and the reasons are obvious. And there's no question that it can give you thrombosis, particularly in the type 3 setting when you have normal C1 inhibitor to begin with, and you're pumping in large amounts of C1 inhibitor. So getting back to the patient, um, unusual cases of swelling, as I said at the beginning, are becoming clearer and clearer and more and more frequent. I just got a, 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 a question from, from CHOP, the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, about a patient that they had referred to them who's having very frequent attacks of angioedema that are affecting the airway. The, the person who wrote